didn't you try to upload this video multiple times last summer? Yes. This time I'm hoping it sticks around this time. The sad news is I have to butcher it so much, crop it so much, edit it so much. So hopefully it sticks around for real so y'all get to hear what I was talking about a year ago as to why this NASCAR movie ruined Burt Reynolds' movie career. So without further ado, I hope you enjoyed this video for what it's worth, and I sincerely apologize for how butchered it looks. I gotta get through it somehow, because this movie deserves to be acknowledged among the big three NASCAR movies. And I decided to keep one topic, because to me, there are some similarities with one Academy Award nominated in motion picture to this particular movie that was nominated for multiple Golden Raspberry Awards. So without further ado, if you haven't seen it yet, hopefully you enjoy it, and if you have, still enjoy it. When you think about NASCAR movies, a large part of the community can instantly name Days of Thunder and Talladega Nights, The Battle of Ricky Bobby. Both are commonly known as quintessential yet flawed NASCAR flicks. Others bring up cars, suddenly Herbie fully loaded, or even Logan Lucky. When you dig down the rabbit hole for other NASCAR films, crap ones like Steel Chariots, a wannabe Beverly Hills 90210 drama TV film that aired on Fox, or Redline 7000, those are the ones that are remembered for all the wrong reasons. But there's also flicks like The Last American Hero, based on Junior Johnson, and Grease Lightning, based on Wendell Scott. There's also one other movie I really want to discuss, and it's the focal point of this video. Have you ever heard about the Big Three? Is this the Big Three? Before that became the most cliché phrase in NASCAR social media since 2018, the Big Three were Colt Trickle, Ricky Bobby, and this man. Ah yes, this movie is about a man who wants things his way. He's the face that runs the place, but rather immature and a CIM pay. He was in awe about a much older, beautiful woman that won't let her guard down. At the same time, she hasn't found her true identity as other men, and women, run her livelihood, with some seeing her as sex appealed and street smart. Once they're at a crossroads, it became abundantly clear that they were meant for each other. The man had to put his machismo, bratty friends in the rearview mirror, most importantly, stay in his lane when it came to lust. There's even a badass scene where one drove backwards down him, and if you dare, you dare get in the way, physicality. Wait, 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 Stop it right there! Shut the music down! Shut it down! Now hold on a second. Why is Licorice Pizza being shown? That's not a NASCAR movie! I thought the review was about racing, not the romantic drama starring Alana Heim, no relation to Corey Heim, and Cooper Hoffman, son of the late Philip Seymour Hoffman. <laughs> Hell, man! I think the biggest injustice about NASCAR films is when they ignore the third big three NASCAR flick. I mean, nobody discusses about it here on this video platform. Even NASCAR pundits haven't seen the movie, and aside from Will Cronkite's appearance in the scene vault and Dale Jr. download, not many people talk about the movie. You've seen the cars at Darlington. The Smithfield Stang was apparently inspired from the movie. And a soundtrack of the movie actually exists! Never played it because the tracks aren't anywhere to see if it's clean or worth playing. They still aren't available on YouTube. But what is this neglected film about? It's about a man who simply was born to raise, a bit of a man whore, hates PR work like fans hating drivers leeching, and a bar finding machine. This is the tale of Stroker Race. When I really thought about finally doing a review for Stroker Race, it's a direct result of realizing the insane parallels to Licorice Pizza. Think about it. What I said earlier does fit the bill, except the age gap wasn't awkward as hell, and the woman was the badass driver in the relationship. I think you could still challenge the likes of Mater, Ricky Bobby, Kurt Busch, and Chris Buescher. Are you serious? But there's a major difference between those two films. A film about the Valley, set in 1973, was critically acclaimed, and rather amazed that two debutante actors, one a musician, and the other being the son of a popular actor, delivered. Paul Thomas Anderson's visuals are simply solid as always, the music is memorable, and one of the only films I can remember specific lines. As for Stroker Ace, based on the 1973 novel Stand On It by William Neely and Robert K. Odom, was beyond panned. 
Before Tom Cruise and Robert Downey Jr. ruled cinema, Burt Reynolds was the man in the film industry with classics such as The Longest Yard, Smokey and the Bandit, and The Cannonball Run. Stroker Ace ended the box office sensation's run of memorable flicks. Burt himself said this film and Cannonball Run 2 was when he lost the audience. Arguably, it wouldn't be until a PTA film where Burt's career was saved. That wasn't until he appeared in another rancid racing film. Might have heard about it. If anything about Stroker Race, at least we got the bubbly yet fast forward Thunderbird from it. But the biggest takeaway, the grandest takeaway of the 1983 film is simple. What really happened last year? Without further ado, does Stroker Ace deserve to be neglected? Ah, 1983, arguably the greatest year in music history. Thriller ruled the world, we were blessed by the reigns of Africa, you also had the Pepsi challenge dividing the country, Scarface getting into people's heads, and it's one of my all-time favorite flicks ever. In motorsports, Tom Sneva finally won the 500, and Formula One so wanted to put the corrupted 1982 campaign behind. As for NASCAR, Daryl Walter was the top dog and Richard Petty was still chasing 200. But when Stroke Race came out on July 1st, 1983, it was already mid-season for NASCAR. So we're really looking at 1982 as the main setting based on the stock footage they used. Oh, and if you love that thing, get ready. Because there was no short usage of stock footage that honestly weighed the continuity of the plot down. Compared to the NASCAR flicks that came out since, you don't really see stock footage that was ripped from television broadcasts. In Days of Thunder, you actually saw footage from Speed Weeks in 1990, yet they were on film, especially before the big wreck involving Cole Trucko and Rowdy Burns that sent them to the hospital. In fairness, Stroker Ace tried doing their own stunt work, but it leaves so much to the imagination, and with stock clips, it ruins the immersion that you're seeing the cinematic experience. Instead, it kind of comes as cheap. And most racing films at that time were cheap, except for Grand Prix of Le Mans. To really get the story of Stroker Ace, you find out that his natural ability to drive came from his friend, Doc's dad, who was fixing to lose the cop. So, a movie always has that memorable phrase, and racing flicks are no exception. I'm dropping the hammer. Robin's son is racing. If you ain't first, you're last. Shake and bake. All right, Stroker Ace, mm -hmm. what you got? Hey, you boys better hold on, because I'm going to have to stand on it. <laughs> You get a boss track from the Charlie Daniels band before going into present time with Stroker driving on three wheels with Lugs Harvey, played by Jim Neighbors, tagging along. Man, he got some skills, I tell you what. Once he barely made it to Daytona, that's when we find out how horny this man is. But the women don't forget who he was. Fling after fling, Stroker forgot until the lasses tell him what happened. Then we get to Carl Edward. Wait, <clears throat> wait, is that Carl Edward? Oh, Aubrey James. Aubrey hates Stroker so much that his team find him as a maniac over something that happened last year. As if you haven't realized, the problem with this movie, we never found out what happened last year. I don't care what you say, I'm telling you, it ain't gonna be like last year. I ain't gonna be like last year. How are people supposed to know what happened last year if you don't really dive into what happened last year? Mr. Cody. Caddy! Whatever. Mr. Caddy also despises Stroker because he's a wrecker. Doesn't use his head despite being a multi-time Winston Cup champion. Mr. Caddy doesn't want Stroker to pull last year's antics again. You have a good race. Yeah, you too. Here again! How you doing, boy? <laughs> I'm chicken, Ted. Stroker and Lugs will run into Clyde Torkel, portrayed by Ned Beatty, who also appeared in a racing movie before, The Last American Hero. Clyde Torkel is the owner of a chicken chain company and looking to put his brand on a cup car. At first, he tried luring Harry Gant to get the Clyde Torkel chicken pit special in the 33 Buick until he found Stroker. And once he was talking with Stroker, let's just say things didn't go too well. Once he saw Petty, come on, Arnold. He tried to persuade him. Which Petty? Richard, Kyle, Adam, Tom, McKenna? Stop it! <laughs> no, I'm sorry about that. No, it's totally Kyle. Totally. Before all that chicken talk with Stroker happened. We gotta go back a bit. Stroker saw Pembroke Feeney for the first time, portrayed by Lonnie Anderson, and it was eager to know her. Unfortunately, Clyde prevented it from happening. While the field took the green flag, Clyde and Arnold have a moment until Clyde tried getting his Mac on Pembroke. She wasn't having it. She's a true saint in the business. Doesn't drink, doesn't smoke, 
and she's a virgin, which they really emphasize that all throughout the movie. Virgin. It's been a minute. How's Stroker doing? Whoa! With gum all over his helmet, it's the end of days for Stroker Race at Atlanta. Already in the hole, Stroker just brushes off and plays dumb dumb with Ken Squire, and his response sums up the kind of man Stroker Ace. He just don't give up. Just once. Just once. I wish you guys would tell us the real story. Shit. Mr. Caddy wasn't having it anymore and threatened Stroker that he'll pull Big Z oil from him. Now, if there was any other driver being threatened about losing a potential sponsorship and drive that will put him in the free agency market, shouldn't that bring some sort of urgency to Stroker? Right? Holy shit! If you haven't realized by this point in the movie, it wasn't meant to be taken seriously like Days of Thunder. You have to have the mindset of a roadblock racer you to think otherwise. It's Stroker and Stroker first. He just does things without thinking about the consequences. Therefore, he got himself fired and is a free agent. So how does he cope with such a fucked up but true feeling? By drinking, of course, and find out that Aubrey, who won the Daytona 500, stole his girl. I mean, one of his former girls. Sometime between Daytona and Atlanta, Stroker found himself a new ride by signing a deal with Clyde Torkel. And already, he wanted his paws on what he wanted in the number 7 for Thunderbird. Lugs wasn't hesitant to point out that such ideas would lead to a six-month six month suspension. suspension. This ain't a Bible class. Everybody cheats a little, huh? And that, my friends, is why Jimmy Johnson became Super Jimmy in the 2000s. You can thank Jack Canals for that. Stroker's ego boost suffered a low blow. The fastest chicken in the South. Oh, how humiliating. But one of the highlights of the film. After missing to start his engine, Stroker went out to win at Atlanta. Everything seemed fine and dandy from here, right? Are we really going to see him go on a monstrous montage of him going for the Winston Cup? How are you, ma'am? I don't know. Ha! Why would anybody want that? Let's get to the true conflict of the movie. No, it's not about what happened between Aubrey and Stroker. Instead, it's Stroker's hatred for promoting his sponsor that gave him a second chance in his Checkers or Wreckers career. Pembroke put some effort into explaining Stroker the company he's repping. I'm sure that'll make him happy, right? And I want that fastest chicken in the South taken off my car. I'm sorry, that's quite impossible. No, he still wants that phrase off his car, and then some. Unfortunately for Stroker, Pembroke Feeney be like, Don't ask me what I think of you, I might not give the answer that you want me to! For the next few minutes, Stroker did some radio spots, he won some races, hugged different sizes of women, buried Aubrey multiple times, Lug's singing abilities being pelted by harsh words like, Come on, son, what's wrong with his singing? Sure, he's no Johnny Cash or Jim Morrison, but he's tolerable. Such pittance. Quite arguably, my favorite scene of this movie is right here. When Stroker just had enough after doing a commercial with that dreadful chicken soup. I think with some effort on your part, we could do it a little better. What do you say? No. No what? No, I don't want to. Mr. Torkel says you have to. It's in your contract. I don't give a shit. I've done some dumb things in my life, but this is the dumbest. Hey, Charlie, what trucker we're going now? Alabama. The humiliation continued, and the fans just weren't having it with that chicken shit special. How is Clyde handling those cheers? Whoever thought of this? <laughs> I love it. Well, I'll be damned. <laughs> He's taking it quite well. Unlike AT&T, ask Mike Borkowski for proof. Stroker in a chicken suit. Yes, he's in a chicken suit, wearing the chicken suit and chicken feet inside the car. So let me just describe his race from Talladega. I thought we were at Talladega. Can we please be accurate for once? False. Thank you. Oh, what was I saying? Oh, yeah. One word to describe Stroker's race at Talladega. Ass! We have to wait until Days of Thunder to see a boss engine failure. Straight to hell, Stroker season went after losing to his foe at Michigan International Super Speedway. You know what would put this movie into the what the fuck category? Showing an angry crowd with some dude pitching his ass in front of a camera for the masses to see. <laughs> What was the budget for this movie? 14 million, okay. How did it do in the box office? It's terrible. Just terrible. I guess Stroker is taking the struggle just fine. 
He's having a fancy dinner with Pembroke. Good on you, man. Good on you. Reminder, he just lost to Aubrey James, and he had a blown motor at Talladega. Morale's got to be low. Not with Pembroke around. But at this point, Pembroke has taken a liking for Stroker. Things are about to get serious, right? What y'all doing? Oh, hi, Lugs. Damn it, Lugs. Can we go back to some racing action? <laughs> Woo! Hey, guys and gals. Kyle Petty, Ricky Rudd, Aubrey James, and Dale. These guys don't like each other, but I need to remind you one more time. We still have not found out what happened last year. Why do they hate each other? Oh, oh, maybe we'll find out right now. All we learned was the finest form of fighting in this scene. It's called clucking with Stroker. A bar fight ensued, like those old Mexican films I used to watch as a kid back in the wild ages of the 1990s and early 2000s. Who won the war? You're damn right it was Stroker. We saw Clyde being an absolute filth to the point of being that word. Pembroke wasn't having it and quit working for him after a kick into Clyde's Torkels. Another trope Hal Nehem and Burt Reynolds unfold in the next scene where Stroker tried running away from Clyde. Did a car fell into the water? Correct! But who got the last laugh? Right, we got one more big winner here! The crowd by hitting them targets. That's when Stroker met Doc and Dad, you know, the two men at the beginning of the movie. While they were catching up, Aubrey gave Stroker another L in this movie. At some point, Stroker's gonna lash out and remember his name, right? Eh, I don't think so. Let's go back to Stroker and Pembroke getting it on. Pembroke got wasted and laid on the bed while Stroker was pondering what he wants to do. For the next three minutes, Stroker was getting around about an obvious one-sided answer here. So what's the final verdict? Ravaging her. Nobody will know. And he broke the fourth wall. After that shit show, Pembroke would ask Stroker if he did it without consent. Still toying around with the question about nobody would know. He tells her nothing happened. She cried right in front of Lugs. Initially, Lugs thought Stroker made her mad like they'd broken up. Lugs bop him because that's what Stroker needed, another ass wolf. We're coming towards the end of the Winston Cup tour, and Stroker is still somehow in this title hunt. Before the championship four, there was the Battle of 82. Back in 82. Stroker was fighting for the championship alongside Aubrey, Kale Yarbrough, and Harry Gann. All right. All right, sweet. Off to Riverside. Oh, there's one last catch. Stroker's latest scheme to get out of the Chicken Pit special was getting Doc and Dad Siegel to do some acting. The ploy was for the Seagulls to play characters, one of them notably being known as Mackenzie from the Miller Brewing Company and put Clyde's backs against the wall with some stipulations. Do I look like a big mouth to you? Oh, I don't know, Clyde. Maybe Lotso's the big mouth since both of you are the same. But I digress. Clyde would have to sell the chicken pit special in order to get a greater profit, but also has to terminate Stroker's contract. Doc pointed out Stroker's questionable background and asked Clyde a simple question. Can you get rid of him? Like that. <laughs> <laughs> if Stroker wins the championship, he'll have to sell chicken for the next two seasons as part of the three-year contract at the beginning of the movie. The deal had to be done by Sunday, October the 23rd, 4 o'clock. What's going on that day, by the way? October the 23rd? In Charlotte, that's the last race of the season. At Charlotte? Uh, not at Riverside. The Winston Cup will be decided at Charlotte Motor Speedway featuring some Bush Grand National cars leading to one of the most blatantly bad edits ever. What a jump cut. Now check out these frame rates. How about this? <laughs> Leading the call is Chrissy Konamaki alongside David Hobbs and Bill Dollar. Back at Talladega. Even saw the lights of the good year Stroker didn't brought any gum. He had just given up on going for the Winston Cup, knowing that he can get out of the Torquil Pit special contract. It's an empty... I mean, I carry on. Damn it! You take me to him! Take me to the son of a The 500 mile dance that began in early on, Stroker deliberately sandbagged to get out of the contract. Fun fact about this clip, Tim Drishman drove the Clyde Torkel Chicken Pit Special in the World 600 in 82, only to be collected in a multi-car crash on lap 45 and finished 40th out of the 42 car field. Woof. Stroker was being a total smartass while on pit road asking for a restroom key. 
Then we saw the film featuring cars exiting out of pit road across the country. Even saw a late model making an appearance, and hello, Texas Terry. How's Aubrey doing? What's Stoker doing? Don't worry about him. Run your own race. Ah! Of course, worry about Stroke, oh boy. Once he caught Stroker and tried to lap him, it finally dawned on Stroker that he's not meant to be a singer like Brewster Baker. But more importantly, he hates losing to that Carl Edwards looking ass. You could say Stroker took it personal. Much like at Daytona, it's Ace, Gant, and James doing it out for NASCAR supremacy. And like at Daytona... Oh hell, here we go again. Really enough me into Gant? Gant spun out! Harry, I mean, <clears throat> I mean, John Anderson tumbles violently out of a top five day at Daytona. Back at Charlotte, everybody did their best sportsman division impression in turn four, bringing out the red... F oh, wait, 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 wait. This is the 1980s. They wouldn't be in the red flag at that time. Caution, period. Stroker comes down the pit road for the final time, and the jack broke. Wonder where the fine folks of Days of Thunder got their inspiration of highlighting a bad pit stop. Arnold, the only man who could touch Stroker's car, saved the day and got Stroker back into the fight. With the season saved, the title fight is now down to him, Aubrey, and Kale. And Kale Yarbrough's Kale car is in the pit with the hood up. Ooh, never mind. Yeah, when Clyde had given up on Stroker, Kale's title hopes ended. Oh well. Clyde went up to the press to publicly fire Stroker just as he got the Q2. Damn down it, son! Blocking ensued until Stroker got the run on the bottom, coming to the white flag. Sorry, I'm not Moonhead. At least it's not sponsored by Credit One Bank. Yeah! Both battled hard until Tim Richmond and another number two JD Stacy special gave Stroker the push of a lifetime. Shout out to Tim Richmond. He's the real MVP of the movie. Aubrey, the petty asshole, decided to finally put Stroker out of his misery for good by pulling his best Matt Kenseth for special and clean out Stroker, lifting him up in the air where you could clearly see how staged it was. Spectacular! Stroker pulled up Clint Boyer to win the Winston Cup Championship at Charlotte. He got out of his car like A.J. Allmerdinger winning at Bristol, and once he saw Pembroke, he tossed his helmet up in the air, and ended up being broken. Following photo op instructions from Bill Broderick, the jig was up, and there was no Miller deal, and Clyde got the receipt from Stroker and Lugs. <laughs> Just give me a clock. <laughs> Finally, Aubrey gave his truce to Stroker. All is good now. Alrighty. They'll have some beers in the after party. But I got one last question. What happened last year? Balloons. Film over. Bloopers. Oh, I guess the film did the best they could by not telling us what happened last year. And with that, Stroker Ace, for some people, aww. For many, thank God it's over. Where do I fall in the line? You'll find out right now. When I saw the film for the first time in 2006, I didn't mind the movie. It was an Ascar film, so naturally I liked it for what it's worth. Still do. I generally thought as an asshole teenager that John Anderson died. From an analytical perspective, you saw how badly flawless this picture was. Questionable scenes, questions weren't answered, the portrayal of the racers were pretty light compared to the other movies. That's fine because it's a comedy film. Those hoping for a serious movie, you aren't going to like it. This wasn't meant to be an Oscar-worthy flick, but it caused so much harm to a lot of people's careers, if you ask me. Obviously, this film was going for a comedic good old boy vibe, and that's totally okay. What it failed to do was draw the outsiders to care about the sport. Let me remind you, Six Pack came out in 1982. People loved that film, and the story was fleshed out. It was good, wholesome, rather family fun movie. Plus, you had Diane Lane, and as a teenager back in the day, that was a W. Stroker Race pretty much was catered to a specific demographic, and I'd like to see it capture the group well. But maybe for some, not too well. Especially that one scene with the dude grabbing. Anyways, Hollywood hated the movie, but those who loved Star Car Racing, they had a kick out of it. But in the grand scheme of things, it's still the bastard out of the big three NASCAR films, and quite frankly, you could say Six Pack is more worthy of being included with Days of Thunder and Talladega Nights. Overall, Stroke Race, from an entertainment point of view, it gets 3 out of 5. On the other hand, if we're focusing on the structure of this movie, 1 out of 5. Funny at times, but a total hot mess. And the reviews clearly gave that vibe of how bad it was. Vincent Camby of the New York Times described it as a must-miss movie of the summer with the chemistry coming off bad. Sheila Benson of the Los Angeles Times titled the review, Stroker, you can go home. She found the film as unfunny unless you're in Reynolds and Nehan's immediate circle. 
Frederick and Marianne Broussard of Specialty and Practice described the movie as running out of gas after 30 minutes. On a lighter note, Gary Arnold of the Washington Post was aware of what the film was about, simply saying a knucklehead by Amiel Most Summer Trifle. He praised Jim Neighbors as a comedic highlight and Lonnie Anderson's rapturously unreal appearance. However, Arnold pointed out that her comedic timing was unideal. The grand takeaway was Arnold's appreciation of the racing visuals that was captured. He understood the immersion stock car racing can provide to folks. In the end, his main criticism was the chemistry of some of the characters, notably the duel of Clyde and Arnold, being nowhere near Pat and Paul from Smokey and the Bandit. Chuck O'Leary of the Fantastica Daily thought it was a 3 out of 4 movie, saying a Sandy Cornpone comedy that made me laugh. So sue me. Then, there's Cisco and Everett's comments. Gene Cisco said the film was among the worst motion pictures of 1983. Fortunately, there's footage to back up his claim saying it was worse than Porky Stu the next day, which so happened to review before diving into Stroker Ace. I wanted to leave this movie, quite honestly, by the time the opening credits were over. What's wrong with Stroker Ace? You name it. It's not funny. The sex jokes are old. Lonnie Anderson isn't given a chance to act, and Burnt Reynolds doesn't even try. The stock car footage has been lifted right from TV. You can see the grainy little lines. The races between Reynolds and the other drivers aren't the least bit realistic or exciting. You can easily see where they're only going 30 or 40 miles per hour. This is amateurish. It reminds me of Cheech and Chong's <laughs> kind of comedies where they really trash their audience. Burt Reynolds isn't living up to his own audience. Burt Reynolds makes two kinds of movies, it seems to me. Movies about lifestyles, like Best Friends in the end, and then movies which are just an exercise of his lifestyle. I have the feeling whenever he gets together with Hal Needham, who is the former stunt right. coordinator who has made this movie and the Smokey yeah. movies and Cannonball Run, they just go down to the South and have a picnic, and he gets his old pals around and his current girlfriend, and they do another retread of these dumb car jokes. You sit there and you think everybody on this movie gave up before they made frame one. Yeah. Um, it's, if, it, if these are his home movies, is what you really course, think, yes. then, you know, show him in his home, not uh, for public idea. consumption. I'll tell you one other thing. Seeing Ned Beatty, a fine actor uh -huh. with Reynolds, I thought of a film they made 10 years ago, Deliverance. Mm -hmm. Boy, have they mm -hmm. come a long way since then. Why does he make yeah, a good a long movie? Way in the wrong direction. Cisco had literal no chill. To be blunt, he's not wrong from an analytical standpoint. He perfectly summed up the issues of the movie that I've illustrated. As for Reynolds, let's just say the grand elephant in the room right now. He took the role of Stroker Ace over the film known as Terms of Endearment. The character, Garrett Breedlove, was intended for Reynolds. Such role for Terms of Endearment went to Jack Nicholson, a role that William Thomas of Empire Magazine said, quote, No wonder Jack was so keen to land this role. It was simply perfect for him. End quote. Nicholson went on to win Best Supporting Actor for the movie. As a matter of fact, Terms of Endearment went down in history as one of the most tear-jerking, memorable films in the 1980s, winning five Academy Awards, including Best Picture. How did Stroke Grace do, awards-wise? Nominated for five Golden Razzies, with Jim Neighbors winning Worst Supporting Actor. In the words of Reynolds regarding turning down the role of Garrett, there are no awards in Hollywood for being an idiot. As already mentioned, Burt Reynolds' movie career never recovered. I say movie, not acting career, because he held his own in the 1990s with programs such as Evening Shade, winning a Golden Globe and an Emmy. What about the Ballad of Stroker and Pembroke? Reynolds did marry Lonnie Anderson in 1988, but they split up in 1994. Tom Cruise and Nicole Kim and anyone? Fast forward to 1997, Reynolds returned to cultural relevance with the Paul Thomas Anderson classic Boogie Nights, a film he probably should have won an Oscar. It's arguably Reynolds' best performance in his acting career, Gritty, serious, and mean. Amazing performance that really accompanied Mark Wahlberg, who had yet to get his foot in the ground as a serious actor. There was no funny business as the world of the adult industry that PTA captured well, while some films like Lovelace struggled. Unfortunately, any momentum died four years later with the much polarized 2001 film Driven. Fortunately, Reynolds would voice Avery Carrington in the 2002 Gem Grand Theft Auto Vice City. that. The less said about Reynolds behind the scenes during the game's production, the better off we'll be. Let's just say there was some tension between him and Rockstar Games. Even during the production of Boogie Nights, there were tensions between Bert and Paul. Take it as you will. Badger Goodger illustrated this to perfection on his video about bad experiences Rockstar Games had with actors. Reynolds will ultimately pass away on September 6, 2018 at the age of 82. 
Lonnie Anderson did very little film roles since Stroker Race, as she would bounce around multiple roles in television for the next several decades. Parker Stevenson, who played Aubrey James, went on to do a slew of TV shows, including being a part of the original cast of a little show called Baywatch. You might have heard of it. Recently, he was part of the Netflix Greenhouse Academy, which lasted four seasons. Ned Beatty continued with his actor career. Some led to nominations for his efforts in The Last Train Home, a TV show in 1989, and the 1991 film Hear My Song. But he's better known these days for voicing the evil Lotso in Toy Story 3. That's how I remember him aside from Stroke Grace and Superman. Beatty passed away last June. And finally, Jim Neighbors' legacy remained intact in the world of racing for many more decades. Rather than being mocked for his singing, he's revered for Back Home Again in Indiana that he would continue doing until 2014. Three years later, Neighbors would pass away. At the end of the day, Stroke Race was a severely flawed film. A guilty pleasure, but indeed the wars out of the big three NASCAR films. Going back to my initial question, does this movie deserve to be neglected? Depends on what you're into. For me, I don't think so. It's worth to watch if you like that Southern style comedy. If it's not your style, skip it. But hear me out on one last thought. Of all the NASCAR films that I mentioned at the beginning, there was one glaring one I omitted. It's a movie called Speedway. The ultimate beta switch flick ever!